Chapter 9 The Great Combat Between the Fox and the Wolf A huge flash brought him to his feet. He thought that the world was collapsing. The crash of the thunder, King Noble's furious roar, Tibbet's hiss, the wolf's howl, the clatter of the rain on the leaves, the uproar of voices. At first everything was confused in the leap that had roused him. The wolf's cry had sounded like an insolent grating echo to the lion's roar. What a great commotion, your majesty, for so little! Silence, vassal! Who are you to dare make comparisons here? Tibbet, still on his branch, sneered. Who said so, if not King Noble? Silence, Tibbet! And you, madame. What do you mean, my fair kind lord? said Lady Proud. You were asleep. I closed my eyes. I do not know what dismays you. So be it, said the lion. No one has seen anything, therefore. Not even I. But you, Renard. The royal pause relaxed. Renard pushed from behind as though by a battering ram, slid across the terrace and was thrown down into the grass about a yard away from Eastgrim. He did not hesitate for a moment, nor seek safety in flight. Everyone who saw the fox in this encounter saw him in his most true image, as a courageous beast, a fighting beast, as eager for life as he was unflinching before death. As he faced Eastgrim, Renard appeared to dwindle to half his size, partly because the wolf, who was a thick, ungainly bully, looked so tall, and partly because the fox gathered himself together, his neck stretched forward practically along the ground, his head lowered, held a little to one side, with his eye on the wolf's stomach instead of his ribs, the vulnerable, sensitive flesh beyond the protective bones. And at the same moment, he struck, like an intangible red arrow. He gave a blow with his head, his teeth bared. Immediately he returned to the charge with the same low defence, and a second time he rushed beneath the wolf's belly, administering the same blow, still bearing all his teeth. This time his leap had carried him further. Surrounding the lists, he could see, through the lashing rain, dark massive shapes who cut off his retreat completely. A blinding flash of lightning illuminated in a rosy glow, a circle of eyes whose gaze was strangely fixed. They vanished with the light, as though hidden behind a wall of water. But there had been something fantastic and terrifying about their sudden appearance, enhancing the wolf's presence, his fury and weapons, so that they seemed to furnish a worse menace. For Renard's eager courage, the nimble strength that he could feel in his muscles, and the sharp edge of his teeth, were dulled and destroyed when they encountered these silent forms, whose eyes continued to burn in the depths of the shade from which they had vanished. And yet, Eastgrim was bleeding. The fox's teeth had caught him and torn him twice. A dew of blood oozed from two long gashes in his pale, hairy belly. Renard turned round, narrowly avoiding his enemy's leap, and his movement caused him to rise up in the air over the wolf. But his very escape through its grace and lightness, had an aggressive violence, a touch of anger determined to inflict hurt. He bent over as he leapt, with the suppleness of a swimmer in the water, and bit one of Eastgrim's ears as he flew past. It began to bleed at once. They found themselves face to face once more, the wolf bigger, bristling and frothing more fiercely and more formidably than ever, while the fox was smaller, subtler, and more firmly resolved that he would not yield one inch of his skin or one hair from his russet and white coat. In the meantime, the storm descended on Breviand, unfurling cataracts which made the leaves flutter from a distance, gleaming on the spears of rain with flashes of brilliant lightning, making the ears hum with loud and terrible crashes which seemed to rend open the heart of an oak tree every second. It was already as dark as night, and the heavy ebb and flow of the shadows submerged the trees, the rocks and the animals, then flooded them in a brighter light, and then covered them again in darkness. And in this way, the darkness and light, 
becoming monstrously intense through their very contrast as they alternately concealed and revealed the branches in torment, the splashing and steaming water running like fiery snakes along the moss, the wild and burning eyes, all this seemed to divide the tormented world into a combat without end and without mercy, as oppressive as a midnight dream that no dawn would ever dispel. This was how the glade of Breviand appeared that evening to the eyes that could see it. A field of battle, alternately dazzling and dark, where two eternal rivals confronted each other, sometimes resembling dream images, sometimes more real than living creatures. One of them growled as he rushed backwards and forwards in murderous attack, blind to everything except the death of his enemy, while the other concentrated on outwitting all this strength, this weight, these teeth, this thunderbolt, while remaining continually elusive, never to be found where death could strike him. That was why Renard seemed to be dancing and flying in this way. By keeping his head, he kept his vision clear, and by the light of the storm he could see the threat which was already burning in the wolf's cruel yellow eyes. By seeing clearly, he kept his courage, and along with it the nimble grace and the confidence that were threaded in the very fibre of his nerves. Renard was alone. He knew now that this solitude was part of his destiny. He had been laughed at for a long time as a ridiculous little animal, and he knew, from the moment he had refused any longer to be duped, that solitude, to which he had consigned himself, had led him towards this combat. Wretched is the pride that will not offer a challenge. Lame is the instinct of liberty that is afraid to hurt the oppressor. How lively, free, direct and sure was the dance of Renard the Fox round Eastgrim the Wolf. A silent dance round a howling, growling death in a circle of enemies who could never forgive such audacity, such biting, cheerful scorn. Leap, Fox, over and under the wolf. Cut into his belly or his side as you pass by, your white teeth bared like blades, slicing his flesh and reddening his coat. Renard leapt and flew, biting, grazing, escaping. He was plucking the beard of death. He was intoxicated by this unending, tragic dance in the midst of this sulphurous storm which made no concession either in its din or its lightning strokes. The entire sky was like a flame now, vibrating with one single flash over a pink and blue forest. One by one, Renard recognised his enemies around him. The enormous Bruin, the tailless one. Snorter, the black bull, brother of the one whom he had driven into King Noble's clutches during the hunt, and the treacherous Tibbet, on whom he had twice had his revenge. Where were the others, far from Breviand, the men and dogs who had trapped him and pursued him? Had any of them made him tremble, or had he forgotten anyone, now that the time had come to settle his score? As he danced about, he thought of all of them, of one and another, both present and absent, and for each one he inflicted another cut, drawing more blood from Eastgrim. Paws, neck and shoulder, after his flanks and his belly, the wolf was bleeding all over, dripping with rain and blood. But he did not flinch, rushing headlong, thrusting and biting at emptiness with an obstinacy that nothing could discourage, for he knew that some inevitable false step, some half pace, would bring Renard's living body into this space where he would meet the mortal blow. Then the blood that would flow would be the blood of the entire beast, and life would flow out with it, away from the beast who was at last drained, at last dead, killed by the wolf's teeth. Eastgrim growled, and from delight, his nose had just touched Renard, and he had smelt his thick coat. The muscles at the corner of his mouth became painful, as though they ached for satisfaction. The very smell of his own blood, mingling with the smell of the fox, increased his murderous rage and hunger. He saw red, felt another bite, a line of fire that scorched down his spine. He caught sight of the red dancer, stretched up, and raised his front paws until he was almost standing, his belly exposed to the daring attack. Renard rushed ahead, unsuspecting of the trap, his sharp nose like a spear. Once more he inflicted a bite and drew blood. And it was then that Eastgrim fell forward again, with all his height, with all his hard, bony weight. Breviard echoed far and wide with his howl of triumph, but his howl was suddenly interrupted and turned into a furious cry, while the thunder crashed again and the lightning lit up the undergrowth. 
Renard had vanished from under his paws as though the thunder had borne him away, consuming him in its blinding veil. In the centre of the arena, the great wolf remained alone, his hide lacerated and red, as though he had been flayed alive. Through the thunder, which crashed more loudly than ever, he howled at the sky, but no one was listening to him any more.